Well, it is a pleasure to be here, and um, I enjoyed the governor's remarks, and I'm especially grateful that the word prevention appears in secret so prominently. And I was asked to try to discuss today some of the issues in using cancer genetics to think about risk assessment and risk reduction. And I know this is a very diverse audience, so I hope you'll forgive me for the fact that the talk is a little bit, um, well, I won't say all over the place, but I tried to have something for everybody, so we'll see how I did. Um, I do have one thing to disclose. I actually won't discuss PARP inhibitors more than one brief moment. So cancer genetics is certainly something active in every major center in Texas and has been a part of cancer research and cancer care now for more than 15 years and really began with Louise Strong and Al Knudsen, who developed the Knudsen Strong hypothesis. But we now are in a place where we have many, many cancer susceptibility genes identified, and still we're talking about this in this setting really as kind of a model system because most of the strongly predisposing genes are uncommon in the population. And then there are increasingly identified alterations in genes that confer a little bit of risk but are much more common. And I'm going to use the models today from the highly uh, intense diseases rather than the others um, for this discussion. But I have to admit that if we could completely prevent um, or detect early every cancer related to BRCA1 and 2 and the HMPCC genes, we would not have made a big enough dent in the cancer problem. Whoops. So I'm going to start, whoops, here where we go here. Okay, so I'm going to start with examples that I think are the clearest, but what I'm going to try to discuss with you is the, the sort of the situation in trying to take these models, which really hereditary predisposition syndromes are, and which most of us try to look at as a way of um, developing approaches that we hope could generalize to the greater population, and we'll talk about some of the challenges in that. So the first example is familial adenomatous polyposis. So for those of you who don't work in this area, this is still a pedigree which most of you will recognize, and this still is a pattern of an autosomal dominant inheritance passing from generation to generation. And in this family, there's a mutation found in the adenomatous polyposis coli gene, and that means that you can test children and other unaffected family members to see if they share the risk that this syndrome confers. This is an example, a picture of a colon. It would be pretty hard to miss if you had a colonoscopy that you saw carpets of these polyps. If you've never seen a colon, it's supposed to be a smooth surface. It looks more like your mouth. Um, but this is hundreds and thousands of these adenomatous polyps, each one of which has the potential to become malignant. And these, the risk of cancer is extraordinarily high. There are manifestations of the syndrome almost throughout the GI tract. And there are a lot of new mutations. So not everybody in these families has a family history of very early onset colon cancer to remind them that there might be something wrong. So these are the kinds of curves that would suggest the risks of cancer. You can see that with FAP, the syndrome, the risk of colon cancer is almost 100% in, uh, in the full manifestation. And that in the general population over there on the right, which I may be able to get to work. Yes, look at that much lower, and that the management of this actually is preventive surgery, which of course is not a model that we have for the general population. Um, and you even have to monitor the piece of colon that you leave behind. But there are variants in this. Not everybody has that 100% risk. And there are trials that have tried to uh, do risk reduction with medication. And the medications that have been most successful are those attacking the COX-2 system. It's important to recognize these individuals not only because you have to prevent their colon cancer, but because they do have risk of cancers elsewhere in the GI tract. So it's not enough to just give a label. You have to change your management for their risk even once you've labeled them as having the condition. This is a paper recently published by my colleague at the Farber Sapna Singhal in JAMA looking at the prevalence of APC, the dominant form, and MYH, which is a recessive form of the polyposis syndrome, looking at this by the number of adenomatous polyps that individuals have. And you can see all the way over, maybe, down here, 
that even with about 10 polyps, the risk of having an APC or MYH mutation was as high as 8%. That's pretty high for a predisposition syndrome, and that suggests that we are missing a large number of people who have mutations in the syndrome, in these genes, and have colon cancer risk. They have a muted form of the polyposis carpeting, but they still have the cancer risk that goes with it, as do their offspring. So this suggests that we are not trying hard enough to recognize these people. Now the second colon syndrome that's been affected by all of this is Lynch syndrome, or hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer. And it was caused that, called that not because it didn't have adenomatous polyps, but because it didn't have the carpets of polyps that are really pathognomonic of the APC syndrome. And this has had a number of criteria over the years, but it's a syndrome because it's a collection of definitions. So you had to have multiple family members affected, early colon cancer, and other associated syndromes as well. And this syndrome can be identified by testing tumors as well as blood. So we were just talking about this, that, um, that there are now national guidelines that every colon cancer in individuals diagnosed under 70 should be looked at for features suggesting the presence of this syndrome. These genes that predispose to this, if we're up to six of them, are mismatch repair genes. They can be abnormal in tumors by promoter hypermethylation when they are not inherited in an altered form, but that are acquired in the tumors themselves. But they can also be inherited in altered form, and they cause these spell check errors, the uh, microsatellite instability that you can target in the tumors. Most people use immunohistochemistry looking for the absence of the protein coded by the gene that may be absent. There are models now to help primary care physicians to um, identify families who should be tested based on what's usually far less risk than we tend to think about. We look at pedigrees like the ones I showed you, and we think, well, everybody's going to come in with a strong family history. But sometimes one person in the family is enough to give a clue that there might be a problem. And that's actually when you want to find families so that you can make a difference in their history. You don't want to wait till they have three or more affected individuals. So in HMPCC or Lynch syndrome, there are a multitude of cancers as well. And we have been less effective as a cancer community. Um, you'll hear from our next speaker, who works in GYN cancer, that I think we have thought more about colon cancer, less, for example, about endometrial cancer, which you can see is still a substantial risk for women who carry these uh, mutations, and ovarian cancer as well. And once you recognize this, then your targeting has to be not only for looking for early colon cancer, but for thinking about either early detection or prevention of endometrial cancer with surgical prevention, hysterectomy. And Karen Liu at MD Anderson has done a lot of the pioneering work in this area. Now you can show that frequent surveillance is actually changes mortality in individuals with HMPCC. And these are old data from the Scandinavians who recognized the syndrome and did screening with colonoscopies every year or two. Anybody who's had a colonoscopy knows how much fun it is, and therefore, it's for a lot of people, it's really not their preferred method of screening. But you do screening every year or two because HMPCC patients have accelerated adenoma production. It's not just like the rest of us who can have a colonoscopy every five years if you've had a single adenoma or every 10 years if you haven't because it takes such a long time to go from a mutated crypt cell all the way even to a polyp of a centimeter that can be detected on standard colonoscopy. In HMPCC, in APC, the, the time from development of an abnormal mutation, I mean, a mutation, but for the second hit, so to speak, to the development of polyps is greatly accelerated, and that's why colonoscopy is done so much more often. So colonoscopy has a big advantage in the prevention world because not only is it early detection, but at the same time, it can be prevention by treatment. You remove those polyps, you can prevent cancers from developing. Now, you can't really do that with carpets of polyps. You'll never get them all, but you can do that in HMPCC if you do it often enough. So if so, here's a technology that was already shown to work in the general population, and by doing it more intensively, you can make it effective in a hereditary syndrome. And you can see that even in these syndromes, there are additional screening that has to be considered. Um, there is chemo prevention for POLA patient, for HMPCC patients. So here's the results of the aspirin trial that was published just last year. And 
colon, I mean, uh, chemo prevention has been a huge challenge. And here is a place where I think we'll ask in all of these examples, do the um, hereditary syndromes actually serve as the basis for progress that we can generalize back to the general population, or is there something different about them because of their mutations that makes them an imperfect model for the development in the syndrome? You'd hope that if you could prevent cancer development in people with such a risk, 100% risks, 80% risks, and in such an abbreviated time that you would be able to generalize what you find in that group back to the general population, but you have to ask if the biology is really similar enough that this will work. Now, there are aspirin trials and calcium trials and many trials in the general population, but this was at least the first that could, in an international coordinated way, launch a trial with enough HMPCC patients to observe significant outcomes. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, I bring this up and this issue of screening because of a finding that's been uh, reported in several groups now around this is now uh, has led to a uh, ASCO YIA grant for one of our junior faculty who came from Memorial, Jeff Oxnard. This is in the world of identifying now in lung cancers, looking for EGFR mutations and finding the T790M mutation in individuals who had not yet been treated with an EGFR targeting agent. So this is a resistance mutation that usually develops in people at the time, well, that you find at the time of progression. But in individuals who had not yet been treated, um, you can find T790M mutations in those who've inherited that mutation and develop their adenocarcinomas. And then the question is, what do we do with them? So, there is a project now to help collect these individuals and, to, and their families and try to define the syndrome. Because you have to ask, is there something different about them? Do they have a polyposis precursor syndrome in the lung? And can you use in these people the kind of screening tools or risk reduction models besides smoking cessation, which I'm sure is part of CPRIT, uh, is in a group that's been shown to have increased risk? Well, this is a challenge. Here's the data from the National Lung Screening Trial showing for the first time that in a high-risk group uh, that spiral CT scans, low-dose spiral CT scans, but CTs nonetheless, could uh, affect mortality. And after all, screening trials are not only about identifying early lesions or finding tumors at an early stage, but if you don't change outcome, then the screening is a failure. Uh, but can you generalize from individuals high risk because of exposures like smoking or asbestos to individuals at high risk from a hereditary predisposition. Now, you can argue that the trials at least should be smaller. You don't need as long, and you don't need as many people to prove the difference. But you also have to wonder if radiation, even in the lower dose model, is a safe exposure for people with an increased um, risk based on a genetic defect. So. I don't know the answer to this, but that is the question, and I think people will, who are interested in this part of, of the world will say first that there is hereditary predisposition to lung cancer, and not just through alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, but through a mechanism that many people are thinking about, and secondly, that we need to take on the challenge of what to do for these people in the meantime. So I'm going to tell you a different story. So this is Lee Framini syndrome, and this is a syndrome that has been near and dear to our hearts at the Farber when Fred Lee was there. Um, Louise Strong studies this at Memorial, Gail Tomlinson, uh, sorry, at MD Anderson, Gail Tomlinson studies this at San Antonio. Lee Framini families are rare, but not that rare. It's supposed to be one in 25,000 individuals with a germline P53 mutation. And for those of you working on many tumors, P53 is often an issue. The manifestations of the syndrome include a risk of many different cancers, childhood cancers, sarcomas, and almost every adenocarcinoma. So here's just a list from a study done long ago showing the range of cancers that can be part of Lee Framini. Now, you don't really look for this unless you see exceptionally early cancers or exceptionally rare cancer types, but you can imagine that the problem with having a P53 mutation is that your risk of cancer is pretty much every cell in your body, more or less. And how do you think about early detection and prevention for individuals in this group? I did want to mention that um, it's been shown in this group and actually our group and others have published that the breast cancers that people with um, Lee Framini syndrome develop are two-thirds of the time ER positive and two-thirds of the time HER2 positive. 
which is a little bit unusual. And I put this in here only because I wanted to give a brief plug for Powell Brown's study of lapatinib as a chemo prevention agent. So this is a drug targeting HER2. And one of the questions one must ask in a trial like this is, who's the high-risk population that you can identify? So Powell's problem, um, project in which we participate looks at individuals with pre-malignant breast cancer, ductal carcinoma in situ, that's HER2 positive or EGFR positive. But you can think that this might in the future have something for, to offer Lefraumini patients. And one of the things you have to think about, as I said, is are you going to have enough patients to mount any study when you have a rare disorder? But it turns out that uh, there is a p53 mutation that's a founder mutation in Brazil. Um, a specific mutation that is actually fascinating, you can track it from apparently a um, peddler, a traveling salesman equivalent who was very uh, productive up a river in Brazil and has left a numerous um, descendants with this mutation, and they do get Lefraumini syndrome. So you do want to think about screening for people, and this is just a little joke, um, but what do you do in Lefraumini? Well, you have this challenge that not so different from the rest of the population when we can't yet really isolate people except by their exposures, that we don't know which tumor might occur first, that we have to use a screening technology that's safe for them since there are data that P53 carriers are, have an increased risk of a carcinogenic effect of radiation exposure. We have to worry about starting in children, um, potentially, with labeling them early and screening them frequently. What do we do for this? The false positive issue, I can tell you from the trials, are a huge problem because anyone who has done screening studies knows that you're always finding things that are probably benign, but you find them anyway and then you have to go prove it, and that you really are going to have to prove that this is effective before you spend money on high-tech approaches to a small population. So we actually did a small study using FDG PET screening because it was uh, used in the evaluation of many of the tumors these people get. And in 15 patients, we found three cancers. And that was surprising, although these are the prevalence screens. So for those of you who do screening, the first time you look at any population, you find all the things you didn't realize were there. And then you really can't count those. You have to start over. So in the first year, though, we found these. And the problem was that it was a technology that is it uses a lot of radiation, so it isn't, it, it could prove the principle, but it isn't something that was going to be adopted overall. And we only really did it to try to show that, that you could actually do something in this group of people who otherwise worry and wait, but haven't been able to do much before. So what can you do for Lefraumini patients who know they have this? And, and this includes the survivors of their first cancers who often live many years maybe their whole lives before getting another one, although multiple primaries are common. So you can, of course, do physical exams, but we know that in no population is that particularly useful. You can do now whole body MR, and I'll show you that. You can do breast MR. Do we do endoscopy? So we can show that there's excess colon cancer in Lefraumini, but it's not one of the most common syndromes. Do you look at tumors that parents worry most about, like brain tumors? Do you do biochemical screens for certain tumors at certain times? Anyway, this is all a question. This is just an example. This is not a Lefraumini patient, but it is an example of a whole body MRI, which is a, an approach that uses about an hour, no contrast, because the contrasts have their own effect, and can look pretty much from head to toe, although it's amusing to me that at the Farber we can do our scans from head to toe, and the pediatricians can only do it from head to knee because of the way their tables work. These are data from the um, Toronto group who did what is not, though this looks like a randomized trial, they did a prospective study um, using whole body MR. And they chose to do that because they were looking at kids with a whole range of syndromes and thinking, how can we safely look at them without radiation? And is there a way? So the Akron group has actually developed the technology. They applied it. Although it looks in these data, and it's true in these data, that those people in the screening program did very well. They did not. They had their cancers detected early. They were all alive at the time of the publication versus those who did not participate in screening and many of whom you can see on the other line. Whoops. Died. Where am I? Uh, there you go. 
so they died. But this was not a prospective randomized trial, and you have to be concerned about the selection factors that would have had some people not choose to be in screening. Uh, maybe they had symptoms, whatever. Uh, but it's, anyway, it was an encouraging beginning. And the question now is, how do we take this to do in a prospective trial to prove that it's worthwhile? So you can lay out all of the kinds of screening tests that you can do in Liframini, but you can see that you could keep people very busy being monitored, looking for trouble, uh, which may or may not be valuable. There is the version of this for children. And the question is, how do you do a trial? So there is now an international consortium interested in Liframini. Um, but what's the standard of care? What do you compare those whole body MRIs against? Nothing, or a whole raft of other thing, other technologies that I showed you. How long do you follow people? How often do you screen them? How often do you measure? So it's been an actual challenge to try to set up a trial. And I have to tell you that the biggest problem has been funding, because even with the participation of radiologists, all of whom would ideally like to have the same scanner in the same, you know, everybody using the same one, which is impossible in an international trial. Uh, we have been ab unable to secure funding, federal or otherwise, to support a trial like this. So here's a secret project. You guys can set it up here in Texas and just invite the rest of us to participate. <laughs> there is NCN, there are NCN screening guidelines. And here, what I wanted to point out was just, you know, we generalize in both directions here. So here we're talking about taking a technology that's been shown to be effective in an early study in Liframini. Now we're talking about breast MRI. Breast MRI has been studied really in BRCA1 and 2, but we've generalized it and adapted it to the guidelines. These are American Cancer Society guidelines for use of MRI, and we've said, well, we'll do it in BRCA1 and uh, Liframini also, although we actually have no idea whether it's the same. But there aren't a lot of these patients, so you end up generalizing back and forth. Um, and I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but paraganglioma syndromes are another rare syndrome, and they're borrowing from Liframini to look for um, paragangliomas by whole body MR. So we all really have to ho hope that this is a technology that works for a number of syndromes. Uh, there are, turns out now to be a large number of genes for these syndromes. More than 25% of people with a, sporad a single paraganglioma or FIO will have a mutation, so we have to be looking for them. But once we find them, how do we manage them? And this is where technologies like this might be helpful. There's also a group at the NCI developing new technologies. So this is an, a DOPA-labeled uh, PET uh, scan using FDOPA instead of glucose, um, looking at early detection of paragangliomas. So a new technology with a great application, but are we going to be able to generalize this outside and make this really worthwhile, or even beyond the National Cancer Institute, who can have people come and have this scan where others are not? So for two brief other discussions here, one is pancreatic cancer, which has got a lot more attention of late. Um, and there are pancreatic cancer syndromes, um, many pancreatic cancer genes, and there is a whole group interested in trying to find early detection for pancreatic cancer. So here for a disease like pancreatic cancer with such a bad outcome, one is certainly interested in the possibility of early detection. And there are consortia and groups interested in this as well. BRCA2 is one of the genes that has uh, become part of the pancreatic families. Um, what do people do in these projects? And there are, have been a number of groups. But again, the issue is without knowing how to find early pancreatic cancer, even in these individuals with a rapid development syndrome, you have a number of possible technologies. These are listed here. And there are a number of early lesions, but nobody's been doing these, these screens in the past to really know how prevalent these early lesions are, lesions like IPMN. And this, at least, is being looked at more now, both in individuals at high risk for genetic reasons and those who are at high risk for exposure reasons. So this is just from a couple of screens. I'm sorry to rush through this part, but the slides can be available if you want them, um, that show just the prevalence of these early lesions found either by endoscopic ultrasound or by MRI or by combinations of both. This is the PAC Gene Consortium project where they looked at a large, at, at over 200 high-risk individuals and found a prevalence of early lesions 
no early, colon, no early pancreatic cancer, but you could argue that was not the goal. The goal was to find the early lesions. And then the question is, what do you do with them? Do you do prophylactic pancreatectomies, um, which some people would do? Do you, how often do you do these screens? What do you make of IPMNs when you find them? Are there ways to move these early lesions without removing pancreatic function? Uh, a lot of work to be done in pancreatic screening and management that can be done in high-risk individuals, and perhaps later, if we can identify others at high risk, we'll be able to generalize from these findings. And the last few minutes, I'll just talk about breast ovarian cancer, where I live more of my time. So this is a classic BRCA1 and 2 family for anybody in the room who has not seen one of these, with a high risk of breast, ovary, and other cancers in the range of 50 to 80 percent for breast cancer, and depending on the gene, as high as 60 percent for ovarian cancer. And here we have a hereditary syndrome where enough people have been tested in the U.S. and around the world that you can have populations who can be studied, which has been an issue in most of the other syndromes I mentioned, except perhaps HMPCC. Um, and there are standards of care and guidelines for managing risk here, both surveillance and risk reduction, many of them surgical, but at least interest in others. So this, there are screening studies not randomized studies in high-risk populations, but at least prospective studies, none in the U.S., one in Canada and the rest in Europe, that have all looked at trying to figure out whether mammogram or MRI or some combination is best. And these data from the Dutch screening study, which is only one example, to show that one of the problems here, despite intensive screening with mammograms, MRIs, exams, is interval cancer development, particularly in BRCA1, where despite all that screening, people turn up with their cancers in between, usually found by themselves on physical exam. The guidelines that are published for these suggest that we should screen all of these women um, frequently, including mammograms, which is a technology that uses radiation, and this is a DNA repair gene, so you have to be a little concerned about that, both BRCA1 and 2. And this is the only place where we at least have put regular screening by examination back into the guidelines uh, that we give out because these patients can get these interval cancers. <clears throat> Excuse me. There has been interest in the possibility that radiation could cause breast cancers as well as detect them early using mammograms, and these are data that I hope you can see um, from not the most recent paper that got a lot of press, but from a better paper, I think, that tried to quantify this risk. And it does depend, of course, on whether women plan to be screened and try to keep their breasts, or whether they're planning prophylactic mastectomies down the road, how much you have to worry about this issue. Um, I really put this only to say that we have generalized from the data on BRCA1 and 2 carriers to these MRI guidelines from the American Cancer Society to everything else based on hardly any data in the other groups. Prophylactic surgery definitely works, and my only concern about that here is that here's a place where you really didn't want generalization, where we thought that by finding the highest risk groups, we could help at least figure out which women really needed to have prophylactic surgery, but what we've seen as for all good reasons, there's been an improvement in reconstruction efforts, et cetera, that the uptake in bilateral mastectomies and reconstruction at breast cancer diagnosis by people without mutations has been increasing regularly over the last 10 years. And <clears throat> I don't know if this is a benefit or not. Um, ovarian cancer screening, I think we're going to hear about later. You have the preventive services people here, but there is certainly at least new biology showing that most of these tumors originate in the fallopian tube and not the ovary in mutation carriers, and that prophylactic oophorectomy really reduces risk almost completely for BRCA2 and nearly completely for BRCA1 and has led to thoughts about other strategies and has changed mortality, which is, after all, the goal. Unfortunately, this is still surgery improving mortality, not screening or chemo prevention with oral contraceptives, but we'll get there. And the oral contraceptive issue is, of course, a double-edged sword. We'll just skip that. Um, for just the last two seconds here, um, there is a difference in BRCA1 and 2 also in the types of breast cancer to which they predispose, which I think was certainly a surprise to me and maybe to many others that BRCA1 tumors are mostly triple negative and BRCA2s are ER positive. And that leads to the question of how much can we generalize from the rest of the data on chemoprevention? 
on tamoxifen, which in this study did lower the risk of second primary cancers, although there are issues with this study. But do we take the data from the large breast cancer prevention trials showing that tamoxifen works and is safe in young women and say that we can use this to reduce at least risk in BRCA2 carriers? Can we use the exmestane aromatase inhibitor data in this way? And do we know enough to say that if we've taken out the ovaries of these women to avoid ovarian cancer and made them menopausal, that they get additional benefit from these medications? And that is a huge issue in the management of these patients, and they still are at risk for the complications here, bone loss. Um, finally, we have tried to think about the biology of the genes, and can they give us specific, if targeted, therapies for prevention? So BRCA1 and 2, as I told you, are mostly DNA repair genes. And our group was at one point funded to do a trial using PARP inhibitors for prevention. Here's a, the mouse data showing that the, you can reduce the incidence of tumors in BRCA1 knockout mice, or with their knocked out in their breast tissue, so xenografts. Um, and we had a trial like this, but we couldn't prove to the FDA satisfaction that PARP inhibitors were sufficiently safe to use in healthy people. And so we have replaced that with a trial based on Nellie Polyak's data showing that everolimus, one of the mTOR inhibitors, um, might be effective because the order of event uh, of alterations in BRCA1-associated tumors actually has P10 loss first and not uh, loss of the second BRCA allele. So we'll see whether this trial can be effective. Um, we haven't explained all of hereditary risk, so <laughs> I don't know whether that's good or bad in light of what I've told you. It's such a challenge to deal with what we know. Um, but we're going to make risk more clearly quantifiable by the addition of SNP data that may help us, at least in BRCA1 and 2, and therefore most likely in other syndromes as well, to give people more specific estimates of when their risk will be high so they can take what data there are and apply them at the times of their lives where they make the most sense. You wouldn't want to do everything I've told you to people in their 20s that you might be willing to do in their 40s or 50s or that people themselves would be interested in doing. So we still have a lot of decisions to make and uh, we're counting on you to fill in all those risks and benefits in the menu. Thank you. <laughs>